I'm delighted that Australia is going to be on the moon and, you know, be exploring and part of the international venture that's there. For a young Aussie to be able to see that, hey, we are part of this. If I want to fly in space, I don't necessarily have to leave Australia like their predecessors have. I could be an Australian explorer. Chris, you've had a space career that is the thing of dreams, and now you've written a space thriller. Can you tell me how much of it is based in reality and what you've experienced? The majority of the book is true. In fact, I think probably 90% of the things that occur in this, in this fiction, you know, a thriller, are things that actually happened. And over half of the characters in it are, are real people, either still alive or have passed away. So that made it really fun to, to kind of weave this, this twisted plot in amongst all of this reality. We all know that there are risks that come with space exploration. Your job has put you in some pretty extreme situations. Can you give me a bit of a feel about how dangerous it is? The most dangerous thing I've ever done was my first space shuttle launch. We can statistically look at my odds of dying that day, that, that November day. And they were like one in 38 over a nine minute period. So those are odds that you shouldn't take lightly. And so my fundamental motivation was, I think exploring and understanding the rest of the universe is worth taking a risk. I would never uh, bungee jump, because there's just, what is the point? You know, I, I don't need to just, titillate my nerve endings. Training your entire life to be able to operate an extremely complex machine that pushes back the edges of our understanding of Earth and the universe and, and exploration itself. To me, that's the grand human adventure. Beautiful, just beautiful. And I was inspired as a kid by science fiction and the original space explorers. There you go. It turned out to be better than I dreamed it would be. And I'm still alive, so uh, so I, it was a risk that I, that I, I took you know in a in a measured way. You also advise companies like SpaceX and Virgin Galactic, both of which have had flights in this year alone. How do you reflect on the commercial space endeavor? This is an advent of technology that is opening up not just the lower parts of space, but Earth orbit and, and everything that lies beyond. And and you know that's the exciting part. I'm just amazed that within a six week period this summer, three different companies, all of them 20 years old, but three different companies managed to take tourists up into space for the very first time. After all those years, it all came down to one six week period this summer. And, and it's kind of a door kicked open now that um, that isn't going to be closed. James, now we're getting involved. What were we doing for the past 50 years? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was such a great interview to watch. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, great. look, you know, for a long time, every time Australia was given the opportunity to do something in space, the computer said no. And the reason we said no was because we thought it was too expensive and wouldn't do enough for our economy. Now, I mean, the, the, the reverse couldn't be more true. For, for every dollar that you invest in space technology or space exploration or space technology development, um, you get an economic return. UK research shows that, for example, when you invest in space communications development, you get a direct return of four to seven dollars and an indirect return of $16 for every dollar you put in. So governments understand that. This is a big economy. The size of the space economy globally uh, by 2030 will be as big as Australia's total annual GDP. Mm. Um, there's plans to put more uh, than 100,000 satellites into space, up from the 3,500 we have at the moment. And most importantly, tonight, uh, Captain Kirk is going to space on, on Jeff Bezos' <laughs> rocket. 90 so, years old as well, right? <laughs> is he that old? 90, I mean, apparently, yeah. My God, yeah. I mean, so th there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of reasons why Australia is stepping up to the mark, becoming a spacefaring nation. But you can't do space on the cheap. So, 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 we, so we need, a, we need a, a better plan and we need more money? Unsurprisingly, for the head of an industry organisation, <laughs> you that's want more my money. argument. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and this announcement today is great because uh, originally Australia had allocated $50 million to the project. The news that NASA is going to give us an opportunity to be part of their program, what that effectively means is that they're going to help us fund the launch. And the launch for this is you know, something that could cost tens of millions of dollars. Um, but this is an area in which we have some strengths. We've operated 
remote trucks before. We, we have trucks in the Pilbara that are operated out of Perth. Uh, that technology, that skill set can be adapted to space. Uh, we've got launch companies, we've got um, satellite companies, we've got space uh, with services companies. Uh, it's all happening here. Uh, some of it very close to here, just down the road in Chippendale. Um, and it's all getting to the yeah. point where we're going to achieve a critical mass for Australian space and that's going to be a very exciting thing. We just need to find enough people um, to make sure we can staff all of these exciting projects.